Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Hello and welcome. I'm Lee Godden, Dean of the uh, Faculty of Law here at Taharenga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. And I'd like to welcome you to the 2023 Lucretia Seals Memorial Lecture. And it's a lecture that is embedded in law reform. And I'd like to uh, offer a special welcome to all our distinguished guests here tonight and a very warm welcome to the Seals family and in particular to Lucretia's parents, Shirley and Larry and brother Jeremy. They've traveled to be here tonight and to support this annual lecture in honor of lawyer and law reform advocate, Lucretia Seals. Along with guests in this room, we have a number of people joining us via Zoom from many different parts of the world, including Matt Vickers. I don't know where I'm meant to do this virtually, but uh, welcome, hello to you, Matt. So we, we have both a virtual and an in-house audience. And as I said, the focus of this lecture is on law reform in memory of Lucretia, who in 2015 went to the High Court to seek a ruling that would allow a doctor to assist her to die with her consent. Her court case initiated a national debate and helped galvanize a parliamentary inquiry into assisted dying. The End of Life Choice Act was passed in November 2019 and a public referendum secured uh, support for the act to be implemented a year later. That is a very profound way in which law reform happens. And I think it's so nice to have the sense of community that was part of that law reform process. And I think that's what's echoed here again tonight. And I'd now like to turn from that law reform process to introduce our guest speaker, Brendan Sides, who has also been very much grounded in a community sense of law reform, but from a different continent and uh, for a different area of law reform. But I think it's very important that we understand that nexus between law, community and law reform, uh, where that is, that gives momentum and it gives that embedded sense to the law reform. I've known Brendan for quite a long time. Uh, Brendan is, uh, as the bio says, an Australian environmental lawyer and law reform advocate, but he has worked very deeply with community, as I said. And uh, in Australia, there are community legal centres uh, that started off being environmental defenders offices. And then government funding was withdrawn. I, how many people were in the office at that stage, Brendan? I think about six or seven working across a whole range of environmental law reform. And I think that was the catalyst for Brendan to take a very bold step and to move from a, if you like, a, a, well, it wasn't a government funded, it was an, a very miserly level of funding, but to found Environmental Justice Australia, one of the leading community legal centres in Australia working on environmental reform. You've probably, through general media, heard of challenges to the Adani coal mine, uh, the work that's been done quite extensively on climate litigation, but also in areas such as forest litigation, seeking to preserve biodiversity. And it's to Brendan's great credit that he spearheaded a lot of those reforms uh, through an expansion of environmental justice. And currently, can you tell me how many people are working in that community legal space on law, on law reform, litigation, and so on? Uh, so that, that gives you some sense of, of that community uh, basis to it. So um, 
part of those community campaigns have uh, been run by the Australian Conservation Foundation. Um, that is the peak body. Uh, it, it is one that, as I said, is grounded by having many uh, community environmental uh, organisations that are associated with it. But it, it has been over 60 years. Um, it's been the primary driver for environmental reform. And Brendan now is uh, working with uh, the Australian Conservation Foundation uh, in campaigns and particularly focused on reform of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And that will be the focus of his discussion tonight is the reform process. It has been a long and hard road to reform of the EPBC Act. Uh, <clears throat> we had a government that for a long time ignored pleas for reform of the legislation. So it is quite some achievement that um, an incoming Labor government committed to reform. I don't want to take too much of what is probably the context for Brendan uh, to begin tonight. But if I could hand over to Brendan now and could everyone uh, welcome him to speak to us tonight. On the line. Thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you for that generous introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, can I um, start by honouring the memory of Lucretia? I'm really honoured to come along and talk here tonight. Uh, as Lee has just mentioned, I've worked in law reform for a long time, but uh, solely focused on environmental law reform and the kind of work that I do, the commitment that I have to that work. I think really pales against the very personal commitment of Lucretia and the, the story that they just told about her success in initiating some very significant law reform here in New Zealand. Uh, and um, a successful campaign for reform as well, evidently. And uh, that's not something I can claim too much of in the environmental law space. Uh, and indeed the story I'll be telling you tonight is really an unfinished story about the quest to strengthen and improve our national environmental laws in Australia. Um, a quick overview to start. I uh, want to provide you with a bit of context and background about the environmental situation in Australia, I guess, for a start, our legacy and the sort of current problems that we face, really important context to understanding the need for environmental law reform and the failures of our existing laws. We have a very complicated, uh, fractious federal system in Australia, I guess, particularly when it comes to things like the environment and who has responsibility for that amongst uh, the various jurisdictions, Commonwealth and state and territory governments. Um, so that's really important context to understanding uh, the current debate around national environmental law reform, uh, the history of national environmental law in Australia and where it's come from. And I guess uh, what might have been an alternative um, title for this presentation, which would be the kind of indirect and controversial path to uh, national environmental law in Australia. I'll uh, talk a little bit about the development of the legislation that Lee just mentioned, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999, uh, mm -hmm. its origins in some early Commonwealth interventions in the area of the environment, uh, the controversies um, around its introduction, and ultimately its failures, I guess, have been evident for some time, but uh, have now formed a I guess, the platform for a significant campaign for reform of the legislation, something that, that, as I said before, is not complete, it's still very much underway, and it's still a question mark, I guess, about whether we're going to be able to pull it off. So picking up the themes of this lecture series, I thought it'd be really interesting to talk to you about uh, some of the current controversies around the legislative reforms, um, some of the drivers of the reform, how the platform for reform has been developed. Uh, and um, some of the sort of significant issues that we're facing in trying to develop a, a modern set of national environmental laws for Australia. Um, I should note at this point too that I am no expert in New Zealand law. Uh, uh, so um, I would not presume to be coming along and telling you that anything that I'm talking about here is going to be applicable in New Zealand. I have a, a sort of a very scattered understanding of some important New Zealand environmental legal developments, uh, the Resource Management Act, which was the benchmark that we failed to meet in terms of 
initial implementations of ecologically sustainable development. Uh, some of the interesting developments around legal personhood for rivers, which have provided some significant inspiration to similar sorts of efforts in Australia. Uh, and some significant climate litigation here too, which I remember having a look at when we were developing climate litigation strategies in Australia as well. Um, so some context, as I said, for a start, Australia is in a pretty unique position of being a very wealthy, a mega diverse country, lots of endemic species, species that are not found anywhere else on earth, but also in having a terrible track record in terms of environmental damage and destruction, biodiversity loss, um, loss of species over the last 250 years or so since um, uh, European colonisation of the country. Since that time, 10% uh, of our mammal species have gone extinct. 34 species in total. Just today, it's threatened species day today. To just today, the um, environment minister in Australia announced the listing of another 38 species under our um, national threatened species legislation, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. So that brings the total of threatened species and ecological communities listed under our national environmental laws now to roughly 2,000. Uh, and that number keeps going up. Um, and one key point to drive home here is that that uh, risk of extinction continues and there's lots of good scientific evidence about the fact that there'll be continuing extinctions in coming years unless the situation is turned around. The wonderful illustration there in the top right hand corner is the Bramble Key Melamis, um, a species of rat that went extinct on an island in the Torres Strait between Australia and Papua New Guinea um, in 2019 under everyone's noses basically. Uh, one of the first, if not the first, species internationally to fall victim to climate change because rising sea levels basically obliterated its habitat. Um, the orange-bellied parrot there, we, you have some wonderful and uh, unique parrots here in New Zealand, but we have some in Australia as well, including this orange-bellied parrot, which migrates between the mainland and Tasmania every year, and it's down to a handful of species and only really hanging on because of captive breeding programs. Uh, and these problems continue, as I said, uh, there's some statistics that have just come out about land clearing in Queensland, where we're still clearing 360,000 hectares of bush per year. So very important context, I guess, to the challenges of, and, and you know, what, what ought to be required of uh, effective uh, national environmental laws in Australia. Some more context. As I mentioned, my work has been, I guess, in contrast to some of the um, presenters at previous lectures in this series, my work has been on government rather than in government as a member of parliament or as a, um, a um, expert working within uh, government to um, uh, pursue law reform. I've worked in non-government organisations, uh, particularly non-government legal advocacy organisations for 20 years or so, starting with what used to be the Environment Defenders Office in Victoria, as Lee mentioned, in 2005. At that time, as Lee mentioned, uh, the Environment Defenders Office in Victoria and the sort of national offices in other states and territories was a sort of fairly small and an effective um, group of organisations largely dependent on public funding. As Lee mentioned, uh, back in, I think it was 2013, uh, the Commonwealth Government withdrew the meagre public funding that was supplied to those centres and we were basically faced with a situation where we either shut up shop or threw ourselves on the public and reoriented ourselves as a far more advocacy-oriented, donation-funded group of organisations, which is what subsequently happened. And this is probably testament, I guess, to the environmental challenges in Australia and the need for these sorts of organisations, but also testament, I think, to uh, lots of wonderful people and committed lawyers who have really seen the need for this sort of work. We've now, uh, as a movement, I guess, grown public interest in environmental law in Australia quite significantly to, well, I think probably in total about 150-odd staff, 100 of those would be lawyers, 50 would be managers and communication specialists and fundraisers and so forth. So it's become quite a significant movement and a powerful force for change in Australia. The focus of those centres has broadened quite significantly as well in the sense that whereas previously they were really just focused on planning laws and environmental laws and uh, providing access to community groups, to courts and so forth, they're now far more broad ranging in their advocacy and in their tactics and strategies as well. There's some very significant corporation focused cases that are now being pursued. Um, in, the, in the climate context, uh, there's been a very significant development of partnerships and collaborations with Australian First Nations communities as well and advocacy for them and their interests, which has sort of broadened out the scope of what historically was a fairly narrowly and white middle class focused environmentalism, I guess, which characterised those centres. 
Uh, as Lee said, I now work for the Australian Conservation Foundation, one of Australia's uh, larger national conservation organisations, by the rather grand title of National Biodiversity Policy Advisor, which basically means that I'm leading the um, ACF's campaign for reform of the legislation I'll be talking about this evening, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999. So we're talking about national environmental laws and the very first question that arises in our complex federal system in Australia is, well, what role does the Commonwealth have in relation to the environment? And the answer, if you look at the constitution itself is, is pretty much none. Uh, the environment, land, air, water, uh, biodiversity, wildlife are not mentioned in our con constitution at all. And it was clearly not envisaged at the time that the constitution was framed that the um, Commonwealth government would be having any role in that area. It was to be left to the uh, then colonies that became the states and territories of Australia to maintain their control and management of uh, land, air, water, uh, natural resources, forests and fisheries and so forth. Interestingly, New Zealand is mentioned in our constitution, as you're probably aware. So it, um, it, the contemplation that New Zealand might ultimately join the Commonwealth as a state was clearly far more on the minds of our original constitutional framers than that our national government would need to step up and take responsibility in relation to environmental matters. So the pathway by which the Commonwealth uh, eventually emerges as playing a significant role as an environmental legislator and regulator is, a, is an interesting and complicated one. It's the subject of tonight's discussion. There was an early emergence in the 1970s of some initial Commonwealth environmental legislation, principally focused on the Commonwealth's responsibilities for managing Commonwealth-owned land and for the actions of Commonwealth agencies, including uh, their actions in planning and funding and working with states and territories on infrastructure projects and the like. That paralleled important developments internationally with things like the World Heritage Convention or the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. And Australia, this has waxed and waned and, and changed between governments of different political persuasions, but Australia has always uh, had some vision of itself as a, as a kind of lead contributor to the development of international environmental law and the principles and norms of international environmental law have in turn played an important influence uh, in the development of Australian law and policy. And indeed, in the 70s, we were early signatories to the World Heritage Convention, to the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. The first nationally designated wetland under the Ramsar Convention was in Australia, the Coburg Peninsula in Northern Territory. So that really explains, I guess, initial Commonwealth forays into the area of environmental regulation, but solely focused on itself as a government rather than attempting to uh, extend its regulatory remit to activities beyond the Commonwealth government sphere. Um, that starts to emerge in uh, well, over the course of the, the years um, after the 1970s and came to a head really with this Tasmanian Dams case in 1983, which people are probably familiar with, one of the signature Australian constitutional law and environmental law cases. Um, the backstory is uh, that uh, the uh, area in Tasmania that was proposed for a hydroelectric dam by the Tasmanian government was declared as a world heritage area. Uh, the then Fraser government um, was very committed to trying to protect the area, but also convinced that they didn't have the constitutional authority necessary to intervene and prevent the Tasmanian government doing what they were proposing to do. The Hawke government came to power on the back of election commitments to actually intervene and do something and then had to follow through, obviously, once they were elected. Uh, they did so by passing regulations to give effect to protection of the designated World Heritage Area. Uh, the case ends up in the High Court and by a narrow majority and a very complex and long judgment, the High Court upholds the Commonwealth's legislative implementation of international um, responsibilities under the World Heritage Convention as a legitimate exercise of constitutional power. So a really important case, along with some other cases of a similar nature, establishing that the Commonwealth had uh, very broad uh, powers to intervene when it came to environmental matters. Very broad because um, anyone who's familiar with international environmental law and things like the World Heritage Convention and um, then uh, later developments like the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Migratory Species Convention, a whole range of other international conventions, uh, give rise to a whole broad range of obligations in relation to the environment. So uh, obviously a very broad platform for the Commonwealth Government to be drawing on those responsibilities as the basis for intervening and, and um, uh, passing environmental laws. This raised a lot of hope uh, amongst environmentalists and those who... Uh, really, I guess, were um, not persuaded that state governments could be trusted to, uh, I guess, follow through with emerging public interest and concern around the environment and calls for greater environmental protection. Uh, 
state governments have always been seen to be quite close to the action in terms of mining and forestry and things that damage biodiversity. And there was, a, I guess, a great hope that this new found con constitutional authority on the part of the Commonwealth would provide a, a basis for the Commonwealth to really step up and take over a lot of environmental regulation in Australia, which indeed has been the trajectory in lots of other areas of public policy. Um, they, we were disappointed, I guess, in the sense that uh, post that high watermark established through those court cases and those sort of case-by-case uh, -case interventions that uh, characterise the coming years, uh, there was really a settlement, I guess, a resolution in the form of the development of this notion of cooperative federalism, which saw the Commonwealth stepping back a bit from the full scope of the powers that they could be exercising in this area. Um, so around forests, uh, the Commonwealth had intervened in some significant issues regarding export wood chips and so forth. But in the early 90s, we were convinced by state and territory governments really to step back and accredit state and territory schemes and to stay out of the area, basically. More generally, the intergovernmental agreement on the environment in the early 1990s saw the Commonwealth and the states agreeing that the Commonwealth would um, restrict itself to what were seen as some legitimate areas of Commonwealth interest around some specific issues to do with implement implementation of international agreements and so forth, but would largely re leave the remainder to the states. Uh, and that's the model that ultimately flowed through into the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999, which I'll come to in a moment. I've included a photo there of a book uh, by uh, Philip Toyne, who was formerly the director in the, in the early 1990s of the Australian Conservation Foundation and went on to um, spend some time at the law school at the Australian National University and was moved to write this book, the title of which is self-explanatory, really, uh, I guess, bemoaning the fact that the Commonwealth hadn't taken up the opportunity to actually intervene far more significantly in relation to environmental issues and it had retreated, I guess, from the, the full extent of powers and potentially responsibilities that it could have taken on uh, post some of those high court cases. Um, so as I said, the, we ended up with the EPBC Act, which really reflects that sort of compromise and the very messy division of labour between states and the Commonwealth when it comes to um, environmental regulation, where we now have a system where we have our national environmental law, the EPBC Act, as well as state and territory laws, uh, all of which are different and all of which are intended to sort of interact in a, and, and coexist in a, in a very messy and complicated fashion that is often difficult to understand, controversial, messy, uh, right for criticism in terms of duplication and overlap if you're a business person trying to navigate your way through the system and problematic from a sort of sort of point of view of no real clarity around who's responsible and um, you know, at risk of buck passing and so forth if what you're interested in is, is effective environmental protection. The way that the EPC, EPBC Act works just briefly is that it covers nine matters of national environmental significance which largely reflect those international commitments uh, that I mentioned earlier, so things like threatened species. Uh, an obligation to protect those arises under the Convention on Biological Diversity. Perhaps our wetlands, world heritage sites, and several other matters. Um, so it doesn't apply to the environment generally. It's restricted to these nine matters of national environmental significance. Most of the attention on the legislation is on its uh, development control provisions and how it goes about in uh, requiring environmental impact assessment for actions that are likely to have a significant impact on one or more of those matters of national environmental significance. And it sets up a system of assessment and approval uh, based on the principles of ecologically sustainable development, uh, which uh, form the sort of centerpiece of the objectives of the legislation. As I've already mentioned, it's intended to operate concurrently with state and territory laws. So rather than a system where uh, responsibilities are, are entirely left to states and territories or entirely taken over by the Commonwealth government, we have a messy interaction between the two and the EPBC Act also contains some provisions that are intended is intended to facilitate that interaction or uh, um, bring together through accreditation arrangements and so forth, um, a sort of more coordinated approach at times, something which has only been partly successful. Uh, the Act is a very long and very complex piece of legislation, as is often the case. It's sort of grown from, I think, an initial 600 pages or so to now about 1,300 pages. It includes a lot of other Commonwealth functions and responsibilities as well, uh, planning for threatened species recovery, management of Commonwealth land, the Commonwealth marine environment, the interaction with fisheries there. So it's a large and complex piece of legislation. And uh, I, just as an aside, I should say, just a, I think a, a, a very good example of how not to draft legislation as well. If you had an approach to drafting that insisted that you put way too much content into an act of parliament uh, and you provided way too much explanatory detail, uh, 
at the expense of actually having a clear and useful piece of legislation, then I, I would take you to the EPPC Act. Um, so does it work? Well, to cut a long story short, no. And this, I guess, circles back to that initial slide around the present situation with respect to you know, environmental challenges in Australia, continuing extinctions and threatens of extinction and large scale land clearing and so forth. Um, one of the interesting features of the legislation, in fact, is that it has built within it a requirement for a 10 yearly review, an independent review of the legislation. So uh, that was first conducted in 2009. A very extensive review with far-reaching recommendations for reform were developed at that stage and never implemented, never actioned. There's the second 10-yearly review that occurred in 2019 and 2020 by Professor Graham Samuel under the previous uh, coalition, Liberal and National Party government, which I think uh, in thinking that they'd appoint a businessman, Professor Samuel, to conduct the review, thought they'd come up with a relatively business-friendly set of recommendations. But Somewhat surprisingly, and in a very welcome sort of way, Professor Samuel actually came up with a, a very thoroughgoing review of the legislation, a very critical review that uh, recommended really root and branch reform of it, and was very critical, I guess, of the lack of effectiveness of the legislation. Um, you can just imagine him looking at the legislation, I think, and saying, this is all about process. There's nothing here about what you're actually wanting to achieve. How are you supposed to work out? How am I supposed to work out whether the act is actually successful when no one's ever said what it is that, the, you know, in terms of outcomes that the act is supposed to deliver? And there's a very strong theme to that effect through the legislation. Um, so, yes, a, a very critical review of the EPBC Act, which has now formed a quite a significant platform for uh, reform of the legislation. The previous uh, um, government um, prior to the Albanese Labor government coming to power, uh, last year really didn't do very much with those recommendations. I should say, I mean, one of the things that we as environmentalists have really uh, fought over the last 10 years or so is not so much a, a battle for improvement of the legislation, a battle, but a battle to hold on to what we've got because a lot of the actual activity and reform proposals over the last 10 years have been about winding back Commonwealth environmental protections and devolving the responsibilities that had been secured through the EPBC Act to state and territory governments. Uh, fortunately, um, with the incoming uh, Albanese government and a new environment minister now in uh, Tanya Plibersek, there's a, a very comprehensive set of responses to the recommendations from the independent review of the EPBC Act and a series of proposals, which I've listed, some of the main ones which I've listed here um, as part of this nature positive plan that was launched by the environment minister in uh, December last year. Uh, they include a set of national environmental standards, the intention to sort of document in subordinate legislative instruments, clear outcomes in terms of what the legislation is supposed to achieve, which will then guide all decision making and implementation of the legislation. Institutional reform in the um, uh, form of a new National Environment Protection Agency. At the moment, decision making under the legislation really resides with the minister or under her delegation, the department. It's a very discretionary system, is often characterised as environmental regulation, uh, and it lacks transparency, I guess, in terms of the way that the minister actually goes about that decision making. So a, a really significant reform would be to, as proposed here, to uh, take that decision making responsibility and put it into a new expert and independent agency in the form of well, what's now being called Environment Protection Australia. Uh, they'll also be responsible for compliance and enforcement, which the current act has been characterised by an almost complete lack of attention to compliance and enforcement. There's only a handful of compliance activities, enforcement activities, um, enforcement action that's been undertaken over the 20 plus years of the operation of the Act. Uh, various other things as well, an enthusiasm for regional planning. I'll come to that a little bit in a moment when I talk about some of the challenges uh, ahead. Uh, and interestingly, and this didn't come out of the Samuel Review, it's kind of a new frame that's developed since, I guess, this idea of nature positive, something that's emerging from uh, new international commitments in the form of the global biodiversity framework and a sort of general move, I guess, to say, well, protecting things is not enough. We also need to think about uh, fixing the legacy of environmental harm and focusing on restoration as well. Um, so that's a, you know, quite a significant new reframing. And I think it's actually a little bit complicated to work out how it's going to be implemented in conjunction with the commitment to maintain the current focus on ecologically sustainable development under the legislation, but it's kind of a, a new and additional kind of uh, level of objectives, I guess, around um, particularly restoration uh, and halting extinctions and um, ensuring that threatened species are recovered and the like. 
Um, just pause here, I guess, we'll take a break here to have a look at some of the drivers for reform. Obviously, there's the independent review, and I think it is a really interesting feature of the EPBC Act, but, and I don't know whether this is a situation in New Zealand, but it has built within it a requirement for a review. As the experience with the initial 10 yearly review demonstrates, that doesn't necessarily mean that reform will follow, but still, there is at least that requirement that a, a thorough review be conducted and uh, it creates a, an opportunity, I guess, um, to develop a a program for reform um, if that's necessary. I mean, the first point there, I think, is the actual, actually the critical one. There's just uh, such a story of environmental decline and continuing environmental decline in Australia that sort of through um, uh, the material that's communicated by scientists and experts, conservationists, but also through things like our State of the Environment report and so forth. So it's very hard and become increasingly impossible to ignore that, although the previous government did. But uh, it, it's really a situation, I guess, that can't be ignored and demands reform because clearly the act isn't working. Public advocacy, including the legal organisations I mentioned, but the sort of broader environment movement has been really critical as well. Um, and, and I should say that there's not there's not a given there, I guess, that it, and it's not an easy thing to do for environmental organisations and even, uh, I would say, particularly public interest environmental lawyers to say, well, these are the tools we're using, but they're broken. Uh, there's a bit of a disconnect there, I think, and I, I know that there was a very intentional and somewhat complicated strategic decision made amongst environmentalists in Australia to actually say, we need to start running down this act and saying it doesn't work if we're going to get it to change. We can't be um, simply defending it all the time, which we were doing because governments are wanting to, to strip it back and to uh, um, uh, cut back protection. So actually embracing the idea that it was broken and putting that out there strongly was a, a very significant strategic move. I think it was critical to actually developing the platform. Um, I think in retrospect, we'll see that there's been some very significant academic contributions to the reform program as well. Uh, there's um, lots of really good environmental legal academics in Australia, but we, uh, some years ago, too, we uh, were involved in putting together an Australian panel of in, in, um, experts on environmental law who did a series and Lee Godden was involved in that work. Um, uh, and those eminent environmental legal e experts put together a series of papers on um, different aspects of Commonwealth environmental law and um, really, I, I think, created some of the intellectual foundations, much of which is not credited in the independent review, but is, is very evident to me anyway, because I know in detail the sort of things that that panel looked at. So that, I think, uh, work of creating intellectual foundations for, you know, what needed to change, but also how, you know, what some of the solutions might be was a really important um, uh, platform or a driver for reform as well. Changing government, I've mentioned. Um, and including, I guess, within that, uh, the um, work that has been done to ensure that uh, the government didn't just change, but that the new government brought with it a series of commitments to things like a national EPA and a commitment to responding to the review in the way that the previous government hadn't. International developments, I think, continue to be a really important driver of reform in Australia as well. And most recently, the 2022 Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, the new plan developed under the um, Convention on Biological Diversity has formed a really important platform sort of new international commitments and principles uh, that have uh, had a, a very clear role in um, feeding into the reform program as well. So some interesting issues to watch. Um, firstly, climate change. Um, one of the really big challenges just from a legislative design point of view, I guess, is how you actually develop environmental laws that are capable of responding to climate change in all its facets. Uh, starting with mitigation and adaptation. Uh, I mean, environmental law has really been about protecting things and trying to, I guess, maintain a situation of stasis and preservation, really. But with rapidly changing environments in the face of climate change, that's just not a tenable sort of approach. So having something that delivers the necessary protection and certainty while also having the flexibility and capability to respond to, uh, I guess, uh, you know, the inexorable march of climate change, but also catastrophic impacts from climate change driven events is really important as well. As I mentioned earlier, those 38 species that have been listed today under the EPPC Act, the announcement by the Federal Environment Minister, um, uh, though, uh, most of those species were listed because of the impacts of the 2019 and 2020 fires. And the slide that I've got there, if you can see the map, shows the extent of those fires uh, in Western Australia and particularly along the Eastern seaboard. Uh, they're huge and dramatic and had a very significant impact on Australia's biodiversity and some of uh, our most important and precious remaining forests. Uh, and, the, you know, the results are becoming clear in terms of uh, existing listed threatened species becoming more threatened and 
uh, as I said, as of today, lots of new threatened species being listed under the legislation as well. So having legislation that can respond to those catastrophic impacts and to the march of climate change is obviously critically important. Um, we also have a really significant challenges in just in terms of how to deal with energy, the energy transition in Australia and the environmental regulation is to protect the environment, but it's ultimately, I guess, a form of economic regulation in the sense that it regulates economic activity that has an impact on the environment for good or bad. Uh, we have a situation in Australia where uh, we're still approving new coal mines and new gas mine, uh, new gas fields in Australia. Uh, the news story there is from The Guardian just last week, where the minister under the EPBC Act approved a new coal mine. There's a whole complicated story about the failure of the EPBC Act to deal with climate change. Uh, there was an initial proposal for it to directly regulate these sorts of projects, but that never got up. And there's been several attempts since to try and reform it to introduce that climate trigger, but they, they haven't been successful. And as of last week, the um, progressive new uh, environment minister that we've got who's committed to the reform of the EPBC Act is making these sorts of decisions and saying, well, my hands are tied. Uh, the law requires me to approve these projects and to not take into account climate considerations, uh, including uh, not only the impacts of the emissions in Australia, but particularly overseas um, from the export of our coal and gas. So, uh, and the government hasn't committed to reform that. The kind of narrative, I guess, the position is that uh, we're doing uh, work on climate change now. We're taking it seriously, but we're doing it over there. That's the climate minister's responsibility. We're doing that through market-based approaches and um, emissions trading schemes and various other regulatory interventions. So there is a looming fight, I guess, around how uh, climate change considerations, including um, how this currently, I think, untenable situation of new coal mines and new gas projects being approved under the, this legislation uh, need to be dealt with through these reforms. And it's looming as an issue that will need to be resolved through probably Senate negotiations next year, because uh, assuming that the government introduces bills to um, uh, progress these reforms early next year, uh, because that's going to be a situation that will be um, unsatisfactory to the Greens and other crossbenchers in our Senate, who are obviously critical to getting the legislation through under our, I guess we don't only have a complicated federal system, we have a comp complicated bicameral system of parliament as well, where uh, getting legislation through requires the support of the Senate. That's a really significant issue, but is almost even a more significant and controversial issue arising around how we manage the conflict between the need for the rollout of renewable energy infrastructure at scale and the harm that that causes to nature, the conflict that that creates with nature protection. And this is turning out to be a really significant issue, political issue and controversial issue in Australia at the moment with EPBC reform now at the centre of it. There are various mechanisms that the government has proposed around trying to deal with that situation, regional planning and strategic assessments to try and make decisions kind of at, ahead, of the, ahead of time and a, at a more comprehensive scale than trying to do things on a project by project basis. Um, systems of zoning areas that are not suitable for development to avoid that sort of conflict having to be resolved through individual um, environmental impact assessment processes and so forth. But I don't know that we've really got the answers and I don't know that we're really grappling either with the fact that even the challenges we're dealing with now are a result of a sort of pace and scale of renewable energy infrastructure development, which pales in significance compared to the magnitude of the rollout of infrastructure required if we're going to meet our targets to transition to renewable energy in a fairly short period of time. So that's a really significant issue to watch as well, I think. Another category of issues is uh, how, if and how our national environmental laws recognise the very legitimate rights and aspirations of Australians First Nations communities. The re independent review was um, uh, spent a lot of time looking at, at, at this issue and was very scathing of the current legislation, uh, describing the kind of efforts to uh, involve um, Indigenous Australians in decision making and so forth as ineffective and tokenistic. Uh, and made some quite far reaching recommendations to um, well, actually, I should say far-reaching from an Australian perspective, I think, but, but uh, far-reaching compared to the kind of um, act as it presently operates to try and improve um, the engagement and consultation of First um, Nations communities in decision-making under the legislation to recognise uh, First Nations knowledge and to put that on an equal footing to Western scientific knowledge when it comes to conservation planning and decision-making. Um, this, uh, the independent review and the recommendations uh, coming out of that in terms of EPBC reform occur in parallel to some very other significant, other very significant controversies around cultural heritage protection in Australia. And the photographs there are the photographs of the Duke and Gorge uh, 
in northwestern Australia, which were destroyed by Rio Tinto a couple of years ago, um, waved through under Commonwealth and state heritage protection laws, basically. So we had a 45,000-year-old uh, uh, cultural heritage site uh, destroyed by a mining company so they could get to iron ore. And that uh, uh, tragic and uh, unnecessary situation, but it triggered a Senate inquiry and some quite extensive commitments to reform of national cultural heritage uh, laws as well, which proceeding sort of in parallel to the EPBC reform that I've been talking about. So as I said, some of the reforms that have been proposed, greater participation in decision-making, um, much stronger representation of First Nations interest in advisory bodies under the new laws. And the review drew a contrast between another body under the EPBC Act, the Threatened Species Scientific Committee, and their very influential role and their ability to insert themselves into all sorts of decision makings and compared that with what's currently called the Indigenous Advisory Committee, which is basically a body which would occasionally be asked to provide an opinion on something, but not really invited into decision making or not accorded the same sort of authority and influence as, as other bodies under the legislation. So there's a proposal to fix that. Um, obviously, this is also occurring in the context of uh, the current referendum in Australia to uh, change our constitution and introduce a voice, which sort of adds a, another la layer of both political complexity, I think, but also I think some interesting questions about um, assuming that the, the referendum bets up the, the role of this new body, uh, uh, the voice, uh, which would be an advisory body to parliament and the executive um, provided for under the constitution, the role of that advisory body in terms of the environmental law reforms that I've been talking about. So uh, in conclusion, I'm going to wrap with a couple of questions, I guess, because I understand we wanted to set aside some time for some questions and discussions, and I'm looking forward to that. I think, uh, and I hope you'll agree that what I've been describing raises some interesting questions around the circumstances that can lead to law reform windows opening, for particularly environmental law, and this is obviously going to be different depending on the field of law that you're looking at. Uh, how you can actually go about pushing those windows open, I guess, or creating those windows and making the case for legal reform. Um, I haven't gone into the sort of technical details in depth, but I think there's some, hopefully some interesting innovations in environmental law that are currently being cooked up through this reform process. Um, and then uh, the uh, issue that I just concluded with as well, I mean, the, there's a, uh, a need across the Australian legal system, but I would say particularly in our environmental laws to respond to the demands of justice from our First Nations communities and how we actually go about doing that, whether they're more effective than uh, the current EPBC Act and so forth, I think an interesting issue to explore. So I'll finish at that point and thank you for your attention and thank you again for the opportunity to come along and, and talk to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if I could open up for, um, we've got about oh, a bit under 15 minutes for uh, <clears throat> discussion perhaps um, picking up on some of those themes in those questions there. Thanks. So I'm going to be facilitator and I'm going to wander down here. And um, so, Sir Jeffrey. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. That was in many ways quite depressing, <laughs> but also positive. And I couldn't help thinking from a New Zealand point of view that we have a set of opposite problems in the environment to the ones you described. Although I do recall that Gough Whitlam said in the Chifley Memorial Lecture of 1957 that the way of the reformer in Australia was hard, and that's an understatement yes. because of the constitution, but the international treaties do, as the Tasmanian Dam case demonstrated, give you a a flight path. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but we can pass anything here within reason because we have a unicameral legislature that, that is small, no upper house, no written constitution, very few restraints, but we still can't get it right. <laughs> now it's it's all in the implementation. And and if you've got a, a government that passes a law, they have to make environmental stuff happen down there and you've got to use local authorities and they've been hopeless at this here uh, absolutely hopeless and and so it still hasn't they had to redo the whole of the resource management act because although it had all that modern stuff that attracted all this attention uh it never happened <laughs> and so what do you say we should do 
Uh, well, firstly, I fully agree. And I mean, in teaching environmental law, which I do as a sessional lecturer in the law school at Melbourne University, yeah. I'm always very keen to emphasize that point, which has been driven home to me by long experiences in environmental law and trying to uh, even convince departments and governments that yes, it, it is actually the law. It's not a guideline. It's not a kind of a suggestion. Uh, the intention when Parliament passed these laws would, was that you would implement them. I, I hope we're paying sufficient attention to that through the EPBC reform process. And I think the institutional reform that I mentioned, the new Environment Protection Agency, sort of a, a body specifically directed to uh, um, take care of implementation, both in terms of its regulatory decision-making, but also enforcement and compliance activities as part of it. The standards and clarity around exactly what the law is intended to achieve, I think is important as well. There's some other re important reforms that I haven't mentioned. There's one of the other institutional reforms that's proposed is the development of this new Environmental Information Australia, which will be responsible for collecting data and to, for, for having a sort of standing monitoring role in terms of the implementation of the standards and the achievement of the Act's objectives. Um, whether that works or not will be very dependent upon the sort of politics around its implementation and whether it's well resourced and and so forth. But at least I think uh, there's there's the commitment there to say, well, we're not only just going to pass these laws and step back and see how they go, uh, let them fend for themselves, but we'll 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 be tracking it and monitoring it as well, and have the sort of institutional capacity, uh, the arrangements in place to do that. Um, it, there's also. Uh, there's been, and I didn't mention this, but there's been since the introduction of the EPBC Act in 1999, some public standing provisions in the legislation, not open standing, but they basically allow provided across a fairly easily cross threshold conservation groups and individuals to challenge the implementation of the legislation and decision making under the legislation. And those provisions will be continued and hopefully expanded in some forms as well. One of the interesting, and so that provides uh, citizens with and groups with the right to um, issue judicial review of, of decisions, but there was also a recommendation for the independent review, which the government hasn't adopted, but we're hoping we'll be able to convince them to do so, uh, to introduce merits review of decision-making under the legislation as well, which I think would be a really important accountability mechanism as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of optimistic, I guess, but I, I, um, uh, I think it, the challenges are going to be significant, particularly because, and this is one of the kind of counter arguments to the centralization of environmental regulation in Canberra at the Commonwealth level, they are quite distant from the action and state and territory governments and local government particularly are often far closer to the coalface, which creates conflicts and problems in terms of implementation. But it also means that, well, I guess they kind of know what they're doing as well, which um, uh, as I said, having all administered distantly from Canberra can potentially be a challenge when it comes to implementation. Thank you. Thanks. And I think, um, Jonathan, thanks. So, um, Brendan, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. And as Jeffrey said, um, somewhat depressing, but uh, that is the nature I really of the world. Didn't intend to come here and leave. That, that, <laughs> but that's that's the nature of the world we're in. And you you touched very briefly on the whole question of the impact of climate change and how that is going to affect uh, well the global environment and obviously the environments of. Australia and New Zealand in profound ways. And I just wondered to what extent you have thought about, as I'm sure you have, <laughs> the question of, well, what is this really going to mean for environmental protection and, and restoration? I mean, we, we, things are going to go backwards. We, we're, we're going to have profound changes to uh, land use and, and, and where plants and species of various kinds can, uh, can survive. And how are we going to manage that transition and, and, and manage to protect kind of at least something uh, of what's currently there now? Yes. Um, I think um, it's an excellent question. I have thought about it. I don't have any answers. But I think, um, uh, I mean, we're starting to grapple with it in the sense of focusing on not just protecting what we've got and sort of uh, trying to actually maintain as kind of pre European settlement kind of vision of what's natural to thinking more about uh, what sort of stewardship might be required to encourage resilience, to promote restoration, uh, to allow even things like um, assisted migration or you know, reintroduction of species and things like that. So hopefully we're getting closer to a framework that, that um, thinks about those sorts of things and um, creates at least the facility, if not the kind of mandate or sort of specific provisions to deal with that sort of stuff.
uh, one of the one of the interesting areas of reform under the legislation is around what what we currently call recovery planning, which will be sort of recovery strategies under the new legislation, and how you actually not just list something under legislation, but work to get it off the list, which in the threatened species legislation is what it should ultimately all be all about. Uh, so I think we're sort of touching on some of those sorts of issues as well. I think the the um, points I was making around First Nations interests and aspirations are really important here as well, because it is true that the sort of current laws are framed around this kind of pre-European arrival a vision of a sort of natural and unoccupied, to be frank, landscape, the sort of whole Australian concept of terra nullius. And once we start embracing the idea that uh, there's actually been, you know, 70,000 years plus stewardship of the Australian environment that has had a huge impact on the shape and form of um, the current environment and could have a huge impact in the future as well, we start to open up that possibility of um, intentional and thoughtful management and thinking of it as uh, I guess not just the environment out there but a sort of social and cultural thing that we're, we're trying to put in place good governance arrangements for so uh, that provides me with, you know that that kind of whole move of um, greater recognition of um, indigenous rights and interests and knowledge I guess provides me with some hope that you know we're on that pathway as well and that's a perfect segue to the next question I suspect. Oh. <laughs> tēnā koe, tēnā koe, Brendan o te rā, tēnā tātou. Um, yes, that, that did provide me with a, um, a segue. I um, would absolutely agree with Sir Geoffrey's sentiments about the RMA and the current reform that our government has just undertaken to essentially replace it with two separate acts, albeit an incredibly long transition. We're, we're going for seven acts. Oh, way. excellent. <laughs> well, there will be three at least. Um, but what I mean, what we've seen a little bit more of in New Zealand, um, albeit I think the RMA had the architecture to be able to do and give effect to Indigenous values and implementation was actually the issue. Um, but what we do see in the in at least one of the new acts is um, a, a very much a centralisation of tikanga Māori or, or Māori values to um, at least be one of the platforms for for the new piece of legislation. And so my question is whether you see that as something that um, is, so first question, realistic in Australia and um, at a practical level, what uh, what effect do you think that racism generally in Australia has to do with the inability to kind of move to some of those foundational principles? Yeah. Uh, to answer your first question, uh, sorry, second question first. Uh, I, I mean, I think um, uh, there's a huge resistance to recognising uh, um, Indigenous rights and interests and aspirations and the significance of the long occupation of the land and so forth. And, and it's just, a, I mean, somewhat depressingly, it sort of looks like the current referendum will fail as modest as the proposal is. And I think that's largely reflective of the the ability of um, some parts of politics to tip into a, to tap into a very deeply racist kind of Australian um, kind of set of social norms. So that's depressing. I'm not quite sure what we do about that. I, I mean, having said that, and maybe on a more optimistic note, the, the kind of um, the stuff that came out of the independent review, the work that's happening at the moment, I think is grappling with how we actually take some of those rights and aspirations seriously and incorporate them within our environmental law in a way that even like 10 years ago was entirely unfamiliar. Um, not something sort of part of my thinking or mindset or something that I thought I would need to be grappling with as an environmental lawyer. So I think that's quite quite um, positive and a, a cause for some hope um, that, you know, if we can't do the big ticket things like um, changing our constitution, which we, we haven't succeeded in doing in almost every case, it's not just this come forthcoming referendum, but if we can't do that, there are kind of more, I guess, um, incremental or nuanced sorts of changes that can be introduced in, through things like environmental law as well. And I, I've been talking about Commonwealth environmental law, but a lot of my other experience has been in Victoria and in, in state jurisdiction around some of the environmental legal reforms that have been developed there in terms of uh, public land management, um, some significant legislation that's partly inspired by some New Zealand experience around the Yarra River and um, creating a, a body which is actually kind of a stewards of that river, I guess, in a way that was quite unfamiliar and unique and groundbreaking in Australia, I think. So... Um, yeah, I think there's cause for some optimism, but um, also uh, you know, the reality is that you know getting that sort of change in a um, environment like Australia, a social environment like Australia, is, is really, really very challenging. Yeah, I think we've got time for one more before we might move to a vote of thanks. Just wanted to explore a little what you mentioned with climate change and the environment, and the inherent conflict, I guess, involved with transition. 
because clearly climate change and from a longer term point of view has environmental impacts and what happens now has long environmental, but then transition has short term environmental impacts as well as long term. Yes. And and there's synergies, but there's conflicts, I guess, even legally. So uh yeah, and I, I mean one of I've made it one of my missions in this reform to try and actually connect together climate um impacts from say new fossil fuel projects with the energy transition that's required and to encourage you know, the development of legislative principles and framework for decision making that kind of insists on those two things being opposite sides of the same coin in other words that it's really important to keep fossil fuels in the ground as it, and as important to actually manage this energy transition as well um we're starting from a very low base with the current epbc act as i said it's 1300 pages of legislation it doesn't mention climate change once not in the whole the whole piece of legislation uh, and, you know, there's multiple court cases over the years that have been fought and currently court cases on foot, including one by ACF against uh, Woodside and the Scarborough Gas Project off northwestern Australia saying, well, it's implicit. I mean, it's, if it's about ecologically sustainable development, then climate change ought to be a consideration. Uh, but that's a, a pretty hard and legally complicated um, path to fight. So I think there's a, uh, a the kind of global response would be to say we just need to embed climate considerations and the, the sort of multifaceted challenge of climate change um, reducing emissions increasing climate resilience having the flexibility and adaptability to deal with catastrophic impacts and so forth as kind of a you know part of the dna of the legislation rather than as an afterthought or something that whereas at the moment it's kind of uh, argued to be implicit because it's not explicit in the whole 1300 pages of the act uh, but it's a huge challenge and i, I mean uh, that challenge is uh, Partly, sort of partly social political sort of challenge as well, I guess. I mean, we're a fossil fuel dependent economy. We're basically still a petro state in Australia. So actually the, the challenge of passing laws that envisage that we you know, wean ourselves off fossil fuel exports is um, a pretty, pretty significant one. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of interesting tactical discussions, I guess, around you know, how far we as an environment movement need to push on this as well, because we want to get environmental law reform, but we don't want to insist that it has to stop every new fossil fuel project, because politically that just seems impossible at the moment. So, um, yeah, a good question, a wandering answer, but I, I, um, uh, it's a really significant issue. And I think uh, the take home would be that we just need to have new legislation that actually thoroughly considers climate change in all its forms and all the sort of challenges it presents in a way that is um, completely uncharacteristic of the current legislation. Um, perhaps if other people have questions, we, we can um, <clears throat> uh, move uh, to, to have people ask them later. But I'd like to now introduce uh, Andrew Butler to give the vote of thanks. Oh, no. Don't run away, Brendan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> vote of thanks to you. Take a seat. <laughs> <laughs> to the Kato, everyone. Um, as one of the supporters of this uh, memorial lecture, I am honoured, very honoured to have been given the opportunity to make uh, a vote of thanks uh, this evening uh, to you, uh, Brendan. Uh, I've been asked to acknowledge by the uh, Dean, uh, and I'm very happy to do so, that uh, this and other lecture series can't happen uh, but with the support of the wider uh, law community, and on this occasion through the generosity of uh, Lucretia's family and through many of our friends who are here uh, today. And um, I obviously want to acknowledge uh, the presence of our family and, and friends at this uh, lecture. So to the vote of thanks, uh, Brendan, thank you so much for your uh, wend wonderful uh, presentation. Um, Lucretia would have loved this lecture. This was a topic dealing with a big, hairy, scary problem. That's the sort of problem that uh, Lucretia enjoyed. You touched on all of the elements that matter in a, in a big reform project of that, of that sort. You talked about the drivers for reform politics and its uh, complications, the importance of process, but not letting process be the only thing that you focus on. You've actually got to have outcomes. You actually want to produce change and you've got to know what the change is that you're looking for. Uh, the contribution of civil society, um, the long-term view, and most importantly, I think, a message I took from your presentation is the need to not lose heart when you're involved in the reform process, because it is so easy to do that. That is one thing that I felt I took, I learned hugely from uh, what Lucretia contributed. It was about kicking something off, getting something started, and telling us all, this is something that's going to take some time to do. And you've just reminded us of that overarching aspect of what it was that Lucretia uh, initiated in, in, in her area and throughout her career. So 
on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I know from the questions that were asked, you are going to be buttonholed immediately <laughs> after this presentation, but lots more things to do. I'm glad I'm next to you because I've got the first question to ask, <laughs> ask afterwards, but uh, can I just thank, uh, thank you. you on behalf of everybody else and ask for a round of applause. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. So everyone that brings uh, these formal part of the proceedings to an end, thank you so much for coming along.